Damn, I'm, I was going to say, I'm, I, you guys are doing great with the, the one question oh, I asked you. I mean, well, that's a lot I feel of like, minutes. Do you want to tag to somebody, tag somebody else? Tag somebody else on the question? I think yeah. my reign is over. So, uh, would any of you... Uh, uh, Can we bring uh, the lights down a little bit? Maybe someone, someone in the uh, in the in the balcony? Uh, yeah, somebody from Pro. Maybe that's in the YouTube. That guy right there? Well, no, in Amy the Man has one. Amy, Amy Man has a question. Amy, Amy Man has a question. Thank you, Sunscreen. Thank you, Tim. Ladies and gentlemen, Tim, applause, applause, applause. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Amy Man. Thank you for looking in the balcony. Yep, you've got four minutes starting now. <laughs> Um, I do have a question that I actually want to know the answer to. Um, I'm really fascinated with when or even if there was a moment when you were first starting out or first interested in comedy and first sort of thinking about being a comic, um, when you felt you codified a joke structure or when you were like, oh, if I do this, it makes it funnier, or this is what it's like, what was your experience with that? Or is that even a thing that happens? It's a really good question. Mm -hmm. With no answer. No, I, I, I have an answer, but I just feel like I've been talking a lot. But I have an answer. Please go if you have an answer. Yeah. <laughs> I, I want to try it too, color. actually. You don't want any part of this. Um, the I had a, I got a I had a period of I don't know if we've talked about this as friends we might have but I just had a period of time where I opened for somebody who had who I was completely dissimilar. From, to, whichever one of those you're supposed to use. Um, a one-liner comic who is, like, offensive, like, like meaning to be offensive and challenging to you. And uh, that person's audience thought that I was, like, an interloper, like, couldn't figure out why I was on the show. Um, and I worked with that person for a year. Like, for a year... I would go perform for several thousand seat theaters that did not want to hear anything I had to say in terms of like my delivery, style, my personality, everything about me, all my demographic things. But at the end of that year, I was like bulletproof and um, recorded an album that like changed my, changed my career, uh, my album Same Sex Symbol, which is still, I think, really good, like it's a really good version of stand-up and it's because um, I had to figure out how to make people laugh that had like... What did you figure out? Um, and this is trial and error, I mean, you know, like more, more or less, where you say a thing and then say it a little differently the next night and it gets a bigger response and you're like, oh. Actually, a lot of it was about body stuff. Um, I don't know. I mean, like, a lot of it was about, like, how I was holding my chest. I know that sounds really... But I, I really factor all that into it. I really think about, like, connecting through the, through the stage, um, like a tree with roots, and then going out into the audience, and then the roots come up and connect to the audience. I'm sorry. It's very, very evil dead. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, what I was doing, I think, was, like, when I first was working with this person, um... Well, I compressed speed a lot. I got faster because they wouldn't listen to me if I mm -hmm. did what I wanted to do, which would be slower. So I got faster. Um, and then I also just got like, my, I just, yeah, I'm even doing it physically now. Like my ch I just led with my chest a lot more open, um, which is like just a much more powerful stance because you're kind of challenging. But that's, it, it, I, I don't mean to interrupt, but that's not like you, you mentioned that, that your album that came out of that was Bulletproof. But yeah. People who are listening to the album are only going to sense your body language. They can't see it. 
So did it convey more confidence or? Yeah, I mean, of course, right? That's what I'm talking about is like, but I mean, I'm talking about command, right? We're talking about command. So like just figuring out how to command your words and your presence and the change that that is, that absolutely translates to audio. I mean, if people can't see it, they can still feel it. One of the things I've always admired about your stand-up is the cadence of it, how incredibly precise the cadence feels as an audience member. And that it's like, you are, you are obviously insightful, obviously funny, obviously telling good jokes, but the delivery feels bulletproof. I mean, it really, like... Oh, man, I'm going to throw up. That's so... so, so <laughs> well, so I hope you don't want to throw up because, like... No, it's just, you know how it is when somebody says something nice and you like them. <laughs> no. You hate it. It feels terrible. You want to die. <laughs> Well, part, I mean, part of the part of the difficulty of the question, Amy Man, is is that you know we all we all obviously have uh, developed our own voices for doing what we do, and it almost feels like if we were to analyze what makes that work, to me anyway, it, it, it feels like this like taking part of magic trick, like I like. But the magician does know how to do his own trick. The magician yeah. knows how to do it exactly. So, but I like I almost feel like I don't want to say. Uh, uh, to Cameron Esposito, like, oh, the rhythm of the way you tell jokes is part of is part of the magic of it, because I don't want to take away from the magic of it, because it's both, the whole idea is that it's supposed to feel, you know, in the moment and and improvisational and as though you're just telling it for the first time, and and you know I can hear the craft and the rhythm that you bring to your jokes in the same way as I can I can hear it in in, in your work, Michael, and, and in yours. Uh, Jackie, but uh, it, I kind of like, I don't want to talk about it. You know what I mean? Like, you're afraid to discuss it because you think it's going to, it's, yeah, that it's like a magician's and, and trick. And it, it has to feel natural to you too. Do you know what I mean? Because, well, uh, yeah, but that happens yeah. over time, don't you think? I mean, you start out with, I guess the question is like, what, what role does structure play in, you know, in finding your own voice? Wow, that's a bigger question. In that, okay, so in the late 90s, I moved to Los Angeles, and the alt comedy scene was something. Um, and there were a lot of jokes about it and stuff like that, but um, I knew a lot of road comics who wanted to do these, you know, there was a lot of really cool rooms where you could do stand-up. And it was more storytelling, it was more of a mix of, of, of and, there, and there were some set-up punch, but there was, like one night I saw a road guy go up in this alt room and like Monday, nights at Largo. Monday nights at Largo so it was um, this Canadian very funny guy set up punch guy went up and the audience was used to a certain different kind of stand-up and so they were grumpy about it and they were not attentive and they were judgmental of his work but his work was quality he was a great joke writer and I can't remember I wish I could remember who he was because uh, he did his set he's a pro I love it when a road guy tries to do these alt rooms because they don't get it and then he which is a shitty thing to say was that Mark Maron? what? <laughs> Mark Maron it was it was Greg Barrett I'm so sorry. Uh, hi. I can't see uh, feel free to strike that from the record. Now, uh, and but we're, follow, we're at sea. We're at and we are at sea. And then, but yeah. following nothing that, gets off the boat. Do you know who followed him though? Was Pat Oswalt. And Pat, Pat Oswalt got up and he said, "Yeah, yeah, that poor guy working on his act like that. You know, him and his writing his jokes and getting up and doing his act like a professional. Right. Uh, instead of just, you know, I love it when an alt guy tries to do the road and says, you know, I was talking to Jared the other day. You guys, Jared, and uh, and essentially he just he just leaned into the and he just he he turned it on it and so like I knew a lot of road guys who were very funny and very smart and wrote a lot and they weren't they weren't hacks they weren't idiots they weren't there was nothing wrong with them but they couldn't do those alt rooms and they would ask me um, why do you get to do them what is it about alternative comedy that you're doing that isn't uh, that that I'm not doing and I said. Right now, for some reason, uh, the, the, the comedy world likes the kind of comedy I do, which is I tell the story of how I wrote a joke, and then I tell the punchline. That's, that is the structure to some extent of my stand-up comedy. I'll tell essentially a funny story, and I will pepper it with 
uh, humorous uh, lines. <laughs> and those will be called the punchlines as we go forward. <laughs> but that's, I mean, that's the technique that I never, like, I, I, that's, I've always done that. And, and it's, a, and it's, it's, you're aware, like, it's a structure, it's not just, like, right this second that you're, you've sort no, of been aware of it. I've been aware of it forever, it. but it, I, I became aware of it in 1998. Because, and I've been doing stand-up since 1984. Hmm. So, uh, for years, nobody liked that. The people were like, mm, we're not booking that. And so there was no work because of that until sort of I, I fell into this niche or whatever. But it's I, that's just the way I write. I mean, Stephen writes an amazing joke right Can I ask you a follow-up, though? Do you think that that was you falling into alt comedy or you being a woman? I wonder if there... Only because mm -hmm. what I find interesting about you, Jackie, is that I think your act works in so many different spaces where I think a lot of people are do have to pick like an alt or club vibe and I think that well, it seems what, like you can succeed places. What you said about places. Bulletproof is that because of, of the stand-up that I did from, from 84 to, to 96 or 95, um, I could play any room, you know? There was a gig outside of Minneapolis that had a train that went around the top, and every 45 seconds, choo-choo! And you're like, you'd have to time the, the punchlines, because they wouldn't turn the fucking train off. They're like, no, the train's signature. It's a signature part of the have you Have you ever played the jukebox in Peoria? Yes. Where there's a... Where there's a racetrack directly <laughs> across the street. Racetrack. A straight-up racetrack. So you hear... Saturday oh, second show. Oh. Yeah. And then a gentleman's club. Yep, shares a parking lot with a gentleman's yep. club. Uh, guess what? Not a lot of gentlemen. <laughs> Just normal Peoria, Illinois dudes born on a Thursday. I'm gonna go look at that lady. I feel pretty confident I could play the, the club in Minneapolis that is the model train. Not any other, <laughs> not any other club in Minnesota. Not Peoria? No. Oh, Peoria. Oh, yeah. You could play Peoria. No. <laughs> I would love to see you play Peoria, because the audience would be confused, but so happy to see you. <laughs> I'd like to take a stab at answering this question that I think is slightly different than what you're talking about, and, and, and maybe it will have application for you guys, which is, uh, it's a question I, that, I, that I'm interpreting your question as essentially how do you know when you've struck on your own voice? And it's a question, I host a podcast called How to Be Amazing, and it's a question I find myself, thank you for people. And it's, it's a, a really good podcast, and I also appreciate Michael's willingness to plug his own podcast. Thank you. <laughs> well, the reason I mention it is one, to plug it, and two, because I often ask a variation of that question because I'm, I'm really interested in it as well, and maybe that's not even the question you're asking. Um, but it is an opportunity for me to plug my podcast. How to be amazing, Mike William Black, available wherever you get your podcasts. And the reason, it, the reason I'm so interested in it is because I find, as a writer and performer, I don't know the answer to the question for myself, and part of the reason I don't know the answer for myself is because I feel like to be uh, to be fully honest as a performer, in a way your voice has to keep changing and evolving as you yourself are changing and evolving. And so there's always, in my mind, a question of, is, is what I'm saying on stage right now honest to who I am in this moment? And it's a very difficult question to answer, I think, uh, in any given circumstance. I'll give, you an, I'll give you just the dumbest example of something that is resonating for me right now and, and, and speaks, it's a very specific example that I think speaks to something that I've been finding for myself and it's specific to me. But I have a joke, I don't know if you guys saw me last night, but I'm talking about the show Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous. <laughs> And I have a tiny line in there, and I say, if you, if you haven't seen it, it was hosted by a talking penguin who would walk around going, hey, look at this shit, look at that shit. And there was something to me about that phrase, talking penguin, which struck me 
as a very specific example of, and it struck me to me, as a very specific example of what I want my voice to be in this moment, which is slightly absurd and, and kind of silly, but also talking to something um, specific and recognizable. And when I find those kinds of moments, those moments that feel honest to me, I then try to, to use your analogy, plant roots there and grow out from there and inform the rest of my jokes around moments like that. And then there will come a time, maybe tomorrow, where that no longer feels honest to me and then I feel like I have to start over. So it's a constantly evolving question. I would ask the same question to you, Amy. How... Oh shit, the turnaround. Yeah. <laughs> This would be a this would be a perfect uh, question for how to be amazing. How do, how do you how did you know when you found your voice as a singer songwriter? Well, I think the reason I'm interested in this question for other people is that for me, uh, I for me, uh, music was just like a big blur, and I could not understand how people could pick out things in it. It was like a voice and then a bunch of other stuff. And it was a complete fucking mystery. And I um, went to this music school that you just have to be able to pay to go to. You don't have to audition the Berkeley College of Music. <laughs> so I went, I went to a summer session and started learning kind of some basic music theory. And it was like, oh, ah, uh, now I kind of, like it gave me a skeleton to start putting things on. And so I, I started to feel like that structure for me was really important in creativity. Like there was that blank page was, was completely useless. So, and also, um, you know, practice and repetition and, and imitation. And, and I think um, another sort of structural thing that's very valuable to me is just a taste level. Like, and it sort of sounds what you're saying is that you look for things that you think are funny to you and, ampl and amplify those. And in the same way, uh, you know, there's a certain level of like lyric writing and, and precision and rhyming and that kind of thing that, uh, that, that I try to emulate that I see in other people. And, um, you know, so to a certain extent, trying to imitate uh, and, and utilize structure from other things is what helps me to be creative and, and have a, you know, and then, because your thoughts are going to be, you know, your thoughts and your feelings are going to be your thoughts and feelings if you master the form. Finding the new thoughts and feelings has been something, you know, how like in stand-up you go along and, and you, you look around for things that are funny and then you write to that and, uh, or things come from that. And then you sometimes spike and I don't know if this happens, it's got to happen in everything, right? Where, where like all of a sudden you've jumped a level and you don't know exactly when it happened or how it happened. And the weird thing is, is when you're in that plateau, it can be frustrating. But when you spike, it can be terrifying because you don't know where you're going to end up. Like I wrote, not this album, the, the Hero album that I just did was very weird just because it happened six weeks after the election. And I have traditionally never done political comedy. And the first 10 minutes of my hero album is jokes that were probably six months to six weeks old. And I put them on the album because I, first of all, I wanted a couple of those jokes to be uh, mine. And second of all, um, I want credit. And, uh, and the other one was, um, it felt like a moment in time that needed to be captured for me. But uh, the, the previous album was so personal and so weird that I never thought that I would write anything so personal or weird again. And so I get scared about where the writing is going to go. Do you guys ever do that? Well, uh, yeah. I mean, I think that what you're saying and, and what Michael is saying is true, that the, the obligation is to be to follow your preoccupations as honestly as possible. And so your voice, you know, once you, once you settle upon it, it might be dead at that point. Like, it might be time to move on. Right. And I think that it is easier when you're younger. Like, if you had asked me 
five to seven years ago, like, hey, when did you figure out your voice? I'm like, as soon as I figured out, I put a dirigible in every joke and make it a steampunk joke, then nerds will like it and I'll have a good time. Uh, and then very quickly, uh, those jokes didn't seem like I could make them anymore. And I didn't know what I was going to do. And I, it, was a, it, was a, it was terrifying. Uh, and then you have to figure out what, what you're actually thinking about, what is bothering you, and what, what's on your mind, and, and, and how to express that in a way that is interesting to other people, and to trust that it, what you're interested in is interesting to other people. And it's much easier when you're younger, because you think your feelings matter. You know, but as you get older, it's it, it's much harder to justify. Like, oh, I'm I'm thinking about you know uh, how my children are disappearing before my eyes and I'm dying. Like, how do I make that funny? You know, obviously, it's funny every more, time. There's also a lot more variables. Like yeah. in that, for, well, for, I'll say I'm only 15 years into. A comedy career, so who knows what's going to happen in the future? I don't feel like that's actually very long to feel to be able to speak on anything with like authority. Cops get a pension after twenty. <laughs> yeah. No, I think you're. It's good. So can we? Can you guys start getting the pension. If you had said, "I'm only 15, I'm only fifteen years into a seventeen-year comedy career," so yeah. what do I know? I'm going to retire very soon. I'm I'm rich. Um, but I I wonder also. This just says not. I don't know. The other thing that I would say is, uh, do you know what? I dream in jokes sometimes, which is how I know that stand-up is a language, because the first time I dreamt a joke, I was like, you're kidding me. Um, so I think it's also, I don't actually write before I get on stage, I write on stage, which for years I felt ashamed of, because people would be like, you have to sit down and do what I'm, you have to be what I'm doing. You. That's exactly. what I'm fuckers. But those people are wrong, because uh, I should just do what I do. So I just think of an idea and then I go and I talk about that idea I talk about it 72 times until there's like an actual joke out of it and then uh, record that. Do you always, I think the answer is already no, but so you, you no. don't always know when something is funny or why it's funny. Do you always know why that something's going to be funny? Well, yeah. Obviously. I mean, just no, as an example, I feel like, like it's like, well, I mean, like, literally, straight up, how do mu how does music happen in your head? Like, I, there's, I cannot understand that. I can answer that for Amy. And then you... <laughs> <laughs> it goes like this. It's <laughs> <laughs> in my head. <laughs> There is no finer scatting singer-songwriter than Amy Mann. You got it exactly right, John. The scat master. You, okay, so... I mean, I, just as an example... I think, I think you know when something is funny because you respond or, or to why it, it's and funny. then you try it in an audience, and usually you're right. Very rarely you're wrong. <laughs> No, but I'm serious, like, usually there are some people who respond my, to it. My proportion is exactly the opposite of that. <laughs> I would, well, what I, I would all, say I, at this level. All I need to say is, you, I mean, usually you're right, there, there is something there, and maybe only two people in the audience respond to it, but they're, they're also humans. And then it's just a matter of refining how you're saying it and what you're saying in order to capture more people, which I think is what you went through. Well, also, you're talking... Do, do you all have the experience of... Because I feel like the other thing about being on stage is like I'm present with the material that I'm delivering, but there's a background program going on. Or I don't know which one of them is the background and which one is the foreground program. But there's two things going on at once. One is telling the joke, and then the other one is noticing that you're telling the joke. Right. Yeah. Right. So like that's how you can write on stage, or that's how you can figure out if something's funny. Right. Somebody's responding to it. You're in the moment, going like, "Oh, they like that." Oh, and then that. Server right. So you have a good something. noticer recorder. Whereas, I mean, it just, okay, so sometimes on, on stage I will introduce a song, I will tell a little story about how I wrote the song, sometimes that little story gets a laugh, and I'm like, why? Why are you laughing? Why did I tell it this other way, and you didn't laugh? What is it? What is it about? Did I... Are you mad when you don't get the laugh? Like is, out is, is, is part, are you are you wanting that laugh, or does it matter to you? No, no. I, yes, it's it's great. It's great because I I also feel like there's an interesting thing when you're talking to an audience as a musician. If you're talking to an audience, Jonathan Colton, and you are and you are funny, 
with your words, and people listen in a certain way, they stay primed to listen to your lyrics in a way that's different. Because I, I, I and sort of observing this, because I did a tour like 15 years ago with Patton and Andy Kindler and a bunch of people. Uh, my husband and I were, we used to play at Largo. Um, and, uh, and every night, you know, it would be like, how was your show? How, like, it was fine, I just don't know what to fucking say between songs. And so I had an idea that, well, we should get like a pinch hitter, like a professional talking to people person to do our banter for us. And so we ended up going on tour. So Patton was, we did a lot of shows with Patton. But, um, you know, so seeing those guys operate, I don't know, like it, it really did focus people's attention in a, different, in a different way. And I think it made it more enjoyable, both parts more enjoyable for people. And, and even though could, our songs were very, you know, sad and depressing. Right, right, because yeah. folk. Um, so, <laughs> I love your new album, by the way. You got a Grammy. Woo! So, uh, it's very exciting. And, uh, so, when, you, when you tell the story about a song, can you, you don't hear the, the story as you tell it? And hear how you're telling it? I mean, I do, I do, and then I try to repeat, like, it, how it got a laugh. Right. Which you'll find out tomorrow. <laughs> and maybe you'll laugh at the parts other people laugh at. But, well, but sometimes, you know, but bef but sometimes I'm like, well, there's always I that curve, think that's right? funny, but there wasn't like a, I don't know, like you, 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 you guys know how to create a moment where this is the time to laugh, and I, I don't know, like I, no, I, I think that when I write, I feel like there's there there are little formulas that I notice, but maybe that's what you're noticing as you tell a thing. Yeah, it's a, tr it's a trial and error yeah. process. The first time you tell a joke, tell me your so secrets, John. <laughs> tell them. Trial and error. <laughs> but the first time you tell a joke, and you have a different energy sometimes. And then the second time you tell a joke, and you try to tell the joke the same way you told it, yeah. that it destroyed initially, it does not. Yeah. And then so the third time, you're like, you got to refine it. And then yeah. the fourth time, you have to refine it. And then eventually, you, you find something that works, right? Yeah. yeah, but you also have to become aware. I'm sorry, you were going to jump in there. Oh, I was just going to say the other, the easiest solution is you just talk really fast. And then you stop. <laughs> applause, 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 applause. But you know, like it totally works. <laughs> it, they, I mean, there is there is a scientific method to it, which is trial and error. You have a hypothesis joke you think will work. You try it out several times. Is the experiment repeatable? You also appreciate that you're experimenting upon different audiences in different circumstances and therefore the samples are different, and, and if it doesn't work one night, that doesn't mean that it's not going to work another night. There are very few, I mean, there are uh, jokes and setups that end up being weirdly universal. It's hard to explain why they are universal. Like, there's a, a thing, and, you know, so this isn't even a joke, but when I went on my first book tour, and I was asked to sign my book in a book signing environment, I did what my writing teacher had always done when he was signing his books, which is to cross out his name and then sign his name again. To this day, anytime I cross out my name, the people in front of me laugh. They think it's hilarious that I'm crossing out my name. It's not a joke. It's, I don't know why. They're like, uh, why do you do that? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> and it's just one of those things that just over now 15 years, I just it routinely becomes a joke and there are there are things that happen that way that you, it's you, mysterious you can't explain why it makes an audience laugh but for the most part you try out something you think is funny it works you try it again it doesn't work but you don't beat yourself up over the fact that it doesn't work you try it again and over a certain period of trials you might know that it does work or it doesn't work for life not beating yourself up i think would be hard well and, because and it's hard to say something that you're like these guys are going to love this and then they don't i mean people have to clap after a song even if they don't like it <laughs> i always get like applause a, applause, <laughs> applause 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 <laughs> but if you think about like you know bill cosby did a set uh at the uh, uh bill cosby's a roofie i don't know king, the name roofie king <laughs> uh, still Can't writing you. i know he's still writing jokes nowhere to perform right but you know he's still writing because he's a comic. So you know he's still writing. So him and his wife go see some jazz concert. And uh, the jazz musician asks him, he does 20 minutes. 
And there's a, ser a series of articles about how the jazz audience uh, just didn't boo him off stage. Some of them laughed, I'm sure. Because at that point, he can milk the goodwill of the audience with just a fucking pudding pop face. And um, But other than that, the other reason that audience sat through it is because they're a jazz audience. They'll sit through fucking anything. <laughs> Fifteen minutes of a saxophone solo, and at the end of it, they're like, well, was there anything good in it? So, I mean, like, literally, they're used to analyzing music from that, I mean, right. that's the only place Cosby could play. Right. Yeah, speaking of, a, speaking of being cognizant of the audience, one thing, you guys have been incredibly patient as we have dissected each other's brains. <laughs> <laughs> we just... I noticed two things over here while we were having this conversation. <clears throat> One was the red light from Sarah saying we're over time. Uh, two was a man dressed as the Riddler from Batman yep. Forever. I had forgotten that you guys were out there. Do you guys want to just take done? some random yeah. questions from the audience? Can I, can I just say one, just one thing that, uh, just as an addendum, that to me, and I hope to these guys too, realizing that there is a, that there's a structure or a formula or method or practice or repetition behind magic is magic. Yeah. That to me is magic. I think it's fascinating. I love it. I love that. I have to pee so bad that I think I'm going to wet the chair. I think I have to go backstage and pee. Go do it. Come back. Go. All right. Cameron's going to pee. While she's gone, we're going to play a little trick on her. <laughs> should, should we do, should we do some... Uh, yeah, bring, the, bring, the house light, bring these lights down so we can see the audience and we'll just take some questions. Do you, there, I just feel like very quickly, because it's late and there's probably other fun stuff happening. And, and right. Okay. 